uh, this morning. You know, our senior pastor, Pastor Bola Gido, has been doing a phenomenal job, um, um, you, know, uh, you know, talking to us about overcoming depression, talking to us about some of the things that we can do, uh, you know, to overcome uh, depression. And as we try to wrap up the series uh, uh, today, um, um, I, I, I just want to emphasize a couple of things that he has said um, and also share with you a few things that perhaps you may want to consider in ensuring that you live above the things that may be depressing, that you live above the things that may be uh, challenging you and that may stand as some sort of an obstacle to you. Glory to Jesus. I said glory to Jesus. Uh, uh, depression. Depression is a terrible feeling. Uh, it's a feeling that is based on an interpretation. Actually, more accurately, it's a feeling that is based on your own interpretation, right, of what is going on or not going on in your life. It's a feeling that is based on your interpretation of what is going on or not going on in your life. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying or I'm not diminishing the fact that certain things may have happened that were tragic. And certain things may have happened that were not uh, the best, you know, situations or scenarios. I'm not diminishing all those things. But I'm saying that at the end of the day, it's about the way you interpret what is going on with you. The same person that says, oh, I don't have a child. That's the reason why I'm depressed. Some people say, look, I don't have a child, but right now, child is not is the least of my challenges because there are some other things. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. The point is this, right? For different people, it is different strokes, right? Different strokes for different folks. So for different people, different things face them, but the way we interpret those things many times determines whether we will live, right, uh, in a depressed state or we will live in a thanksgiven state or in a state of uh, uh, happiness or in a state of joy. Glory to Jesus. I said glory to Jesus. So it's a feeling of dissatisfaction. It's a feeling of dissatisfaction. Now, dissatisfaction in itself is not bad. Because, listen, the Bible says that, you know, um, uh, he that compares himself with another is not wise. Now, the challenge many times with comparison is that we allow the comparison make us feel a certain way. And that comparison is not supposed to make you feel bad. Instead, it's supposed to challenge you to do more. Because there is something called healthy competition. Are you with me? In business, right, everybody will be mediocre until somebody comes and changes the game. I, I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So competition is not bad. Checking what other people are doing is not bad. Comparing yourself with them to an extent is not bad. But when that comparison now stops you from sleeping at night, there's a problem. When that comparison has now created a situation where you cannot be happy again, then there is a problem. Why? The goal of depression is to suck life out of you. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22, New Living Translation. And let me tell you something. All of us will feel dissatisfied at some point or the other in our lives. If you are not dissatisfied right now, you are about to be dissatisfied. Or you are just coming out of a dissatisfaction. Everybody feels it at one point or the other. But Jesus never said that you will not be dissatisfied. Jesus, even for Jesus, Jesus also was depressed. Praise God. Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass over me. Ah. Glory to God. But the point is this, right? How do you overcome? How do you thrive in spite of what you're going through? Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a broken spirit does what? Come on, church. Does what? In other words, the goal of depression is to take strength out of you. When you are depressed, the small things of life you cannot enjoy. Your child comes home and he carried first in class. But the money, the broke that you are broke is not allowing you to see the first. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. You say, okay, I carry last. Just give me money. I, I, because if you've ever been in that kind of situation before, everything else doesn't matter until that thing that you are focused on is resolved. But that's not the way life is supposed to be. Why? In life, good and bad are happening at the same time. What you choose to focus on becomes your experience. As you are seated here, some people are here and they're enjoying the service. Some people are here and they're thinking about the money that they owe. But the difference between you and somebody else is not that the guy does not have challenge. It's that they just refuse to wear the challenge on their face. Because let me tell you something. If you owe somebody money, what does worrying about it in this service do for you? I want to ask you. You should be grateful you are not in the FCC custody. Praise God. Am I speaking to someone this morning? So, the point is this, right? Difficulties may arise. Don't be surprised. 
The nature of difficulty is that it will arise. James chapter 1, my brethren, count it all joy. Come on now, you know the scripture. Count it all joy, what? Did he say if? No, he said what? He gets appointment. When I say, when are you coming to my house? That means there's a time, right? Yeah. Hey, all of us, depression, anxiety, anger, you get appointments. Choose your own. Everybody collect your portion. Praise the Lord. So, God never said you will not go through challenges. In fact, Jesus said, in this world, you will go through how many? Plenty tribulation. Plenty. He says, but... And the bot is always the good part. Hallelujah. It says, but, hallelujah. I know you are going through hell and high water, but uh, uh, the reason why you have not been dead uh, is because God still has a story uh, in your mess. Uh, and out of it is coming out a message uh, that will change your life forever. Uh, if you believe it, shout amen. Uh, yeah. Glory to God. So, so, don't let your dissatisfaction rob you of living life. Glory to God. You don't have a child, but you can still go to the beach and swim. Hallelujah. Why? See, the goal of dissatisfaction is to suck life out of you. It's like putting a straw in your spirit and just sucking the life out. Refuse it. Tap your neighbor say, refuse it. Tell somebody, say, don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Listen, the Bible says that there is no temptation that has come upon you, but that which is common to us, all of us get them. In other words, you know what that, see, one of the things they showed me, right, is that even the people who are happy have something that is not going well. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, I used to think that comedians have no problem. <laughs> that comedy itself can be the problem. Why? Because they're just busy making everybody laugh. But the things going on in their lives is not funny. Hallelujah. Recently, we heard in the news some that were attacking themselves. Because he paid me, he did not pay me. It's, 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 it's after cracking joke, all of you laughed. No money. What a job. Somebody say Hallelujah. So, don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Now, how do you overcome? How do you get to a place where you don't fall for these things? Why? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11. It says that we should put on the whole armor of God. So, because we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. Satan has devices. Satan has tools. Satan has all those things that he uses. But the Bible says that we should not fall for it. Because we should not be ignorant of his devices. So, how do you do that? The first thing is this. Getting out of challenges, getting out of issues is to talk to somebody. And this is the power of a community. Acts chapter 4 verse 23. This is the power of a community. This is the power of a small group. This is the power of friends. This is the power of godly friends. Glory to God. The Bible says as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to other believers and told the, what the leading priests and elders had said. The, listen, if you read in, in, in context, Peter and John had preached, preaching the gospel. They were arrested. They were flogged. All those types of things happened. And the Bible says the next thing they did was to go back to their group my question to you today is which group do you go to which group do you go to where do you stay mrs john shared a very powerful story in the second service I, I, you know and you know i didn't see her so i wanted to ask permission so but now i'll share the story praise the lord hallelujah and she talked about the fact that how she was depressed during covid because she lost a friend of hers the person i mean imagine this is tragic Take your kids to school in the morning, gets back home because of marital challenges, drinks sniper, and dies. Locked all the doors, locked everything so that nobody will come and save her, and dies. Now, it's, the, the point is this. Her interpretation of that event was now that life is nothing. So you know what that means? She now started creeping slowly into a, into a state where everything she did, she went with a mindset that life is nothing. Wake up and go to work. What's the point? Life is nothing. That's how depression starts. I, I, does someone understand what I'm saying? And that's how you sleep into that, these kind of things slowly. Uh, uh, you know, in fact, you can't even have a healthy relationship with your spouse. Why? Life is nothing. So once life is nothing, what are we talking? What are we doing? 
Even if your husband is trying to touch you and say something, say, oh, God, like what? Okay, what are you looking? Okay, all this thing now, where are we going with it? Have you met people like that before? Say, okay, so what's the point? Okay, you do, do, do. Yeah. Where are we going? Nothing. Why? Life is nothing. And slowly but surely, that started happening. In fact, she said, the part that she said that shocked me, please don't do this, amen. amen. Said she called her husband one day and said, honey, if I die, these are two people you can marry. Why? Depression would lead you to say things that you should not be saying. Glory to God. I said glory to Jesus. But something happened. A friend of her reached out to her and came to carry her for long. Listen, you need people that will come and carry you whether you want to go or not. I don't, do you have those types of friends in your life? People that will come and sit down and say, oh God, you are not better, I'm not going home. My wife and children have told them that they should release me for the next one week. Until you are alive, I will not go. Do you have those types of people in your life? Listen, if you have only one person like that in your life, you are blessed. One. You don't need two. You just need one. Someone that will say, guy, yeah, wear clothes. I did here. Yeah. I say, go brush. And when you refuse, you enter your room. You know, there are some people that can't enter your room. You need a friend that anywhere you can enter. Anything you can enter. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. So the first thing is this, talk to someone. The Bible says when David came back in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and everything was spoiled and they cried. After crying, he lifted up his voice. He said, call Abiathar. Bring me the effort. There must be someone you can talk to. A dangerous man is a man that has nobody to talk to. Especially men. See, if you are dating someone and nobody can talk to the person, you are not dating anybody. Are you listening to me? I just wonder, I love him, I love him, I love him. Hey, 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 marriage is blind. I love is blind. Marriage is an eye opener. They will show you when. And you must test the fact that the person is accountable to somebody else. So just do something one day that annoys him. Do it. Then let him be angry. And you say, Baba, oh yeah, please go and talk to your friend. And they talk to him. If it does not work, he's not accountable. He just, it's just mouth. Glory to God. So talk to someone. The second thing is this. Maintain the right perspective. Maintain the right perspective. Maintain the right perspective. Listen to me. Things don't have to be as difficult as you think they are. The fact that you are going through a challenge is not proof that God is not with you. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Verse 23. 23 to 24. This is Jesus. Jesus has just finished doing some things and he was going somewhere. So the Bible says he got into a boat, went across the lake with his disciples. Next verse. Suddenly a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. If there is anybody that waves should not try, it's Jesus. I, I, do you understand what I'm saying? But the wave gave mind. If wave can wave Jesus, ah, they are coming for you. Ah, no, 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 no. They are coming for you. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. They are coming. What am I trying to say? Are you saying that God was not with Jesus when he was in the water? God never said you will not go through. But he said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He says, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Glory to God. Why does he comfort you if you are not going to cry? The reason he comforts you is because you will cry. It's because there will be challenges that will move you. There will be things that will make you feel like, listen, I need to dump this marriage. But because you know that though he slay me, he says, yet will I trust him. You say, yet will I trust him. Because I know that there is no victory without battle. God told me one time, he said, this is your season of overwhelming victory. I was rejoicing, but at the same time, I knew that it's overwhelming fight. Because it's only in overwhelming fights that you have overwhelming victories. I don't know if you understand. So you know what you need to do? Brace yourself for the challenge. In fact, if there's no challenge in your life, you should be worried. I grew up as a kind of Christian where if you wake up in the morning, they told us that if you wake up in the morning and you hit your leg on a stone, you should go back. That is, we are missing prayer. They did not pray that money. How many of you, they tell you things like that when you're growing up? That, that God may not, that that day may be bad. All sorts of things. 
And the second part is this. Stop ascribing meaning to what has happened. Meaning that God did not design. Numbers chapter 13 verse 33. I want to show you something. It says, we even saw the giants there, the descendants of Nile. And like, next week there, we what? Hey, wait till. Were they grasshoppers? But what? They what? Remember, it is a feeling that you give yourself. An interpretation. God saw them as people that are giants defeating. They just saw themselves as grasshoppers in the presence of giants. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Can God be seeing somebody today as a victor, but you yourself are seeing yourself as a victim? Is it possible that the way God sees you is more than a conqueror, but the way you see yourself is that everybody is against me? Attaching narratives to things that are not real. I was in the car one day, I was driving. No, I wasn't driving, I was in the car. And so as I was driving, it was on the Monday morning, I was going to work, and I looked and I saw an accident that had happened on the road. And you know what came to my mind? What will come to most of us' mind? Ha! Huh? On a Monday morning. Immediately, the Holy Ghost said to me, what day is an accident good? Sorry, is an accident good on Tuesday? Is it good on Sunday? So accident is not good. Why make it worse by attaching Monday morning? You are single, you are 35. Yes, you are single. But why make it worse? Uh, can you imagine? I'm 35. Uh, duh. The reason why many of us are challenged is that the interpretation we give a thing is greater than the thing itself. Okay, where is it in the Bible that thou shalt not be single at 35? Hallelujah. Marriage is a function of readiness, not a function of age. The wisdom of Solomon has nothing to do with the age of Methuselah. You can be 9, 69 years old. We only have one verse about you. He lived, he born, he died. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not how far, how well. Jesus had three and a half years. We are still not recovered till today. So, Baba, calm down. Stop attaching narratives to things that you are going through. And the next thing is similar to that. Proverbs, chapter, uh, Philippians 4, 8. Philippians 4, 8. Be selective about your focus. Be selective about your focus. There are certain things you should not focus on. There are certain things that continually depress you because you keep looking at them. Be selective about your fo focus. The Bible says this thing. Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. You know, fix your, fixing your thoughts is a deliberate act. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not, it's, you don't accidentally fix a thought. You must be deliberate about it. It says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Why? Not because depression does not exist. Did you notice he didn't acknowledge all those other things? Why? Because he wants you to focus on what should be your focus. That's why faith called the things that be not as though they were. It does not deny what exists. It only superimposes what it wants. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Faith does not say, I am not sick. Faith says that in spite of this, I am healed. Because some of you are conflicted in your mind. Hey, hey, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Listen. Faith does not deny current reality. No. Faith superimposes what it wants on what the current reality is. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are two different things. So if somebody asks you, how are you feeling? Ah, right now, not too good. But guess what? Give me time. Why? I'll be alright. I'm getting there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. So, when you are selective about the things that you're talking, that you're focused on, you know, and I, again, you know, Mr. John preached an incredible s service in second service. If you need to go get the CDs, you know, and she talked about the fact that there was a time things weren't going so well, and she went to meet her pastor, our pastor, senior pastor, Pastor Bajido, and he said, maintain a gratitude journal. See, and you know what? The things in this life are very simple. Sometimes, 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 the way out are in the simplicity of things. But we try to complicate it. Christianity is so simple, it takes a genius to complicate it. 
And you know what? In that gratitude journal, what I got from it is this. The reason why she kept a gratitude journal was not because she was jobless at night. But it was because she wanted to change her focus from focusing on what didn't go well that day to focusing on what, well, what, well, what went well that day. One time, I tried it. I didn't do it for me. I did it for someone else. Actually, it was my wife. So I, I realized that her birthday was coming. And I think at the time, maybe we had gotten into some fights and things like that. So six months onto her birthday, I kept a book. Every day, I wrote something I was grateful to God about her for that she did that day. So let me tell you something. If the, if I, the annoying, she, I was annoyed during that six months. But you know what? I chose to write the correct things. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, babe, today, the 3rd of May, you did this, 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 right? I, I'm grateful to God for you, blah, blah, blah. Men, men and brethren, it was not easy, but I did it. I, managed, I wanted to do it for one year, but <clears throat> the spirit was willing. The flesh was weak. So, so six months. I did it for six months. And I gave her the journal. So on her birthday, oh, baby, happy birthday. So I packed everything, and I gave her the gifts. She left all the gifts. It was that journal she went to. When she read it, I just heard hearing cry from the other room. What have I done again? I be, do you understand what I'm saying? What have I done again? When I entered the room, she, it was the book. She was crying. Ah, I said, Jesus. You say, can you imagine? You were noticing good things about me. Even when I was being stupid. You said it, not me. <laughs> but you know what I'm trying to tell you? Is that it shifts your focus automatically. It's a very simple act, but it's very powerful, extremely powerful. So you go out in your day, and even though the day didn't go well, you didn't have an accident. Just write it. Amen? Your boss, your boss that is normally angry, today, he looked at you and smiled. Write it down. One day, you will go back and see that the Lord is good. That's what the Bible means when it says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. It says, and it will surprise you. But the reason you are doing it is because you are choosing what to focus on, not what not to focus on. I, I, am I, is my English correct? Praise the Lord. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. And let me tell you something. Here, because somebody say, see, I'm just facing reality. The God that said you should call things that be not as though they were, he is not naive. Are you aware that the Bible is not stupid? Are you aware that the Bible is one of the most real books you can ever read? Glory to God. Because these are recordings of things that actually happened with people. So, God is not naive. Why? Because while you are being real, you don't want to die in realness. Call the things that, are be, not, that be not as though they were, so that at least you can survive. Glory to God. And let me tell you something, and I'll talk about this before I close. When something is challenging you and facing you every day, you need a daily message for that thing. Glory to Jesus. I said, glory to Jesus. Look at what God said about Paul. What Jesus, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, verse 16. What Jesus said about Paul. Acts 9, 16 and 17. He says, this was when Jesus had reached out to Saul, who was going to become Paul. He now goes to meet Ananias and says, Ananias, go and give Paul a message. This is the message. He says, verse 16, verse 16. And I will show him how much he must what? Hello. Hello. God is calling a man and is calling him to suffering. I, sorry, am I the only one that is reading this thing? The call of God on Paul was to come and suffer. God has not even called you to come and suffer yet. Though. You are just saying, so you have not seen the far. You are angry. This one, his calling is I will show him what he must what? Verse 17. This is what Ananias did. Ananias, sharp guy. It's not my, from my mouth that you hear that Chicha Peking have died. And Ananias went and found Saul. Ladies, I said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me to you by regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. What happened to the suffering? Did you notice he kept quiet on the suffering? But what did he tell him? Oh, my son, my son, be filled with the Holy Ghost. You said, You'll be happy. You know what I'm saying? That feeling is so that you can endure. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? But you know what? The amazing thing about Paul, verse, chapter 20, verse 24, he says, none of these things move me. Hey! This is someone that was beaten with rod many times. 
He suffered shipwreck. He was in the open sea for three days. He says, none of these things move me. He was encouraging brethren from inside the prison. He said, brethren, I say unto you again, rejoice. Meanwhile, him that was in the prison, what was he doing? So if God has not called you to suffer, be grateful. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because this is the price for writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Before you celebrate the two-thirds of the New Testament, just take two-thirds of his suffering. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Somebody say hallelujah. So the fourth thing you can do to overcome depression, the fourth thing you can do to make sure that you stay in joy is what I call jumpstart your joy. Jumpstart your joy. Find anything that helps you jumpstart your joy. Growing up, I learned how to drive with a Peugeot 504 manual. How many of you know how to drive manual car? Huh, some people don't even know what manual is. You learned with automatic. You, are do you don't know how to drive. Let me just tell you. You don't know what it, calls, what it means to downshift. Hey, Jesus. Oh, Lord. I am ready to... Anyway, so, so that's how I learned. Now, something, there's something called jump starting a car. When you start the car and it's doing... Tayun, nyun, nyun. So back in the day, right? What we used to do is what we call jump start. Now, you can jump start for going forward or coming back. The skilled people know how to use reverse to jump start. But anyway, so, and then, you know, ah, man, the blessing of God is good. Then we'll go and suck fuel. We'll open the bonnet. Suck fuel into the carburetor. If you have never drank fuel, you don't know what it means to drive. I don't understand. So you suck fuel into the carburetor. Then when they're starting the car, you start doing... Poop, 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 poop. Ah. So you don't know what I'm talking about. You, have you ever used screwdriver to start a car before? When you touch the alternator and the kickstarter, boom, boom, boom. Ah. What car were you driving? <laughs> Ah. Me the is there. he knows what I'm talking about we, these were the kind of things we were driving normal normal praise God anyway so what it means to job start a car right please forgive my local language in Yoruba people they say why are you yourself as in you will <laughs> how do you yourself how do you explain yourself motto? as in <laughs> so it's a oh, glory to Jesus Jesus help me now it's a little bit of a complex um, thing that you know you, you press the clutch and the accelerator, right? So, when they push you, and you gain some momentum, you put it in gear, gear two usually, and then you, poo, poo, poo. anyway, anyway, you get the point. So, the point is this, you are jumps, okay, if I, sorry, let me use a better example. How many of you know generator, where they pull? I better pass my neighbor. <laughs> now, it's, it's a form of jump starting. Why? You don't have a kick to start the engine. So, what do you do? You roll the rotor a little bit, and then the alternator picks it up and does the rest of the job. That's why you are not, if you're gen, you are not always doing like this. <sighs> if you are beginning to do like this, something's wrong with the generator. Are you, are you, maybe you have done overfloating, all those types of things. Ah, Jesus Christ. Sorry, I'm remembering things. <laughs> I'm remembering. <laughs> when you go to Chick's house and the car will just mess up in the girl's front yard. <laughs> hey, babe, Alpha, Alpha, just pop the hood. Hallelujah. Ah, anyway, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> when you do that, what happens is that the engine just starts to run, right? And then there's something called an alternator that makes the engine keep going. Jump starting your joy means find something that will get you there first. Once it gets you up, listen, that thing will keep you going. The challenge with many of us is that we don't understand what it means to jump start your joy. You need to find things around you that will jumpstart your joy. There are certain things that should take you out of a mood and put you to another mood. Glory to God. All the songs on your album cannot just be David Doe. Uh, <laughs> Glory to God. And listen, some of you don't understand the role of motivational speakers. Let me tell you today. Because you're always insulting them that every time aspire to perspire to respire. Do you want to retire? <laughs> the role of a motivational text is not to keep you going, it's to get you started. Because once you can start, you will usually find enough energy within yourself to keep going. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Once you get out of bed and you feel somehow, once you can kickstart yourself, once you enter the office, life changes. I, does anybody know what I'm talking about? That's what they are supposed to do. 
There are certain texts, there are certain things I read that if business is looking depressing, I go and read it. There's a speech by Theodore Roosevelt. It's called Man in the Arena. You need to Google it. I believe it's 1940 or so. It says, credit does not belong to the critic. It does not belong to the one who points at where the great man has fallen. It says, credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood. Who knows that in the end, he will taste of the triumph of victory. And even if he fails, he fails while daring greatly. Ah! Glory to Jesus. I don't know about you. When I read things like that, my ginger, my swagger. Ah! Listen, even if, I, even if it doesn't take me far, it will get me started. That's all I need. I call it jump-starting your joy. It's looking for anything else on the outside to get you into a place where from there, you can keep going. If you were able to jumpstart your joy, your interview may have gone differently. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. And the last thing is this. Spend time in prayer, in worship. Especially worship. Oh my goodness. Listen, I cannot overemphasize this. David said, he said, Bring, after they had kidnapped everybody, carried everything, burnt everything, the Bible says when he had no more strength to cry, he called for Abiathar. He says, bring me an effort. What is an effort? An effort is a priestly regalia. David wore it and got into the place of worship. And in that place, the Lord spoke to him. There is a reason why when Saul had a spirit of depression that came upon him, they had to call David to come and play an instrument. There is a reason why when Elisha was upset with the other kings to get himself back into a place where he could prophesy, he called for a minstrel. Some of you will say the, the most important part of the service is the word. So you are targeting the word. You have missed the worship that will deliver you in many cases. In ways that the word cannot. Some of the most powerful breakthroughs I've gotten in my life have been in the place of worship. Listen, the pastor did not preach one word. I was sharing with them in the first service. 2010, I will never forget as long as I live. I was, I was going to get married in that December. As at March or June or something, I think I had just 50K in my account. My brother, 50K. Actually, 55,000 something. It was on a Tuesday midweek service. I'll never forget. I was kneeling down. My hands were on the floor. And I was saying, God, how am I going to do this thing? And God spoke a word to me. I carried out an instruction. And from that singular act, I got a deal whereby at the end of my wedding, I declared profit. You know, many people after wedding, they owe people money. You say, sorry, you, how much are they owe you? No. After the wedding, we declared profit, my wife and I. The profit was what sponsored the honeymoon. Praise the Lord. What am I trying to say to you? Listen, in the place of prayer and worship, in the place of prayer and worship, one of the things you should not take lightly, especially when you are going through a depression, is the power of confession. What you say. What you say. Ah, listen, what you say. On this phone, right, I have the confession I declared from May, sorry, from June 2022 to December. I also have the one I'm declaring from January to June 2023. Then I'm working on the one I'll do from June to December. The confession is 11 minutes and 23 seconds long. Every morning, my drive from commute to the office, that's what I'm declaring. Why? Remember what I said to you. When a challenge faces you every day, you must have a solution every day. Every day I'm speaking to things that are challenging my focus. And I don't take it joke, I don't joke with it though. Once I enter the car, that's what we are doing. One day I was driving, a friend of mine saw me in traffic. He wound down, he said, Wind down, Joe. I, and that was the period where I was declaring my confession. He just saw my mouth moving. He said, Why? Why? If I miss that confession, once I enter the office, it don't finish. Uh -huh. But are you, I can still call you on the phone. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Uh -huh. So it was later when he called me. He said, Ashak ah, was calling you. Why didn't you wind down? I said, my brother, he's okay. Why? You are not there when the challenge is challenging me. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Listen, when you get into the word, one of the things that will happen to you is that over that depression, God will speak a word to you. And you know what Joseph said? I wish I had time. You know what Joseph said to Pharaoh? He says, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You know what that means? 
any answer, anything that comes to you in the spirit that gives you peace, that's God's answer to you. I don't know if you understand. So you are going through a challenge. You are going through a marital issue. And all of a sudden, God speaks to your heart and says, I have given you peace. Listen, take that peace and go to the bank. If, I, if you are very smart, you will take that word. Craft a confession around that word. When I said this, I got a few people sent me a message. He said, Pastor, please, can you share that confession with me? I can't share it with you. Why? It's, co it's coded to me. I don't know if you understand. It's my coding. Why? There are personal things I'm believing God for, for my children. All of them, their lives are ah, in my mouth every day. You wake up in the morning and that thing is depressing, is depressing you. Just write a few words. Begin to declare it every day. I promise you, listen to me. Do it every day for six months. If nothing changes, eh? Come back. It's impossible. I dare you. Hey, I say I dare you, sir. Why? The word of God is quick and powerful, active and alive, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing unto the dividing asunder of the soul, joints of the spirit of the marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. You cannot consistently declare God's word and you will not see a miracle. It's not possible. When we sing songs like, I cannot call on your name and end up in shame, you say, I'll end up. During the process, you might still be looking like shame, but in the end, it must convert. Ah, the Bible says, so mightily grilled the word and prevailed. As long as you are consistent, that word is growing. As long as you have not uprooted your seed, that word is growing, sir. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Acts 27, 25. Paul said, he says, he says, brethren, he says, I believe that it shall be even as it was told me. The question is this, what has God said to you? You are in a state where things seem like they are not working. Make up your mind for, for the next seven days. You are not going to listen to a lot of You are not going to listen to David. You are just going to listen to what? Go to on Harvesters TV. Download sermons from Pastor Balaji. And every day, listen, my challenge to you, two sermons every day. See, let me tell you something. You must understand something. The Bible says that the word of God is medicine. When they give you medicine, there are different doses depending on what you are going through. Some of you need to be confessing morning, afternoon, night. 12, 9 a.m., 12 noon, 3 p.m., 6 p.m. Depending on the gravity of the challenge. Why? You cannot learn. Ah, the Bible says when the clouds are full of rain, they will of themselves empty into the earth. You cannot be filling up clouds in the spirit and the ground will be dry. No. No. No way. And let me tell you something. This thing is not about location. It's not about I'm in America, I'm in London. You can be in London and be... You are not in London. You are done. God spoke to me. He said, listen to me. He said, this thing that you are about to do, if you ever believe that because of what is going on around you, I'm not with you, he said, that will be your experience. So, since that day, no matter what happens, what happens to me is not proof that God is with me or not with me. What happens to me, right, is just a manifestation of what I'm telling God. So, the proof of whether God is with me or not is in my hearing his voice. He says, my sheep hear my voice, not my sheep see the activity. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. My sheep hear my voice and they know it. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. So I beg you in the name of God, take out time to pray. Take out time. If, if, if you don't have strength to do it, ask people to help you, to join you and do it together. Find an accountability partner. Find somebody that can call you up and say, guy, wake up, it's time to pray. It's time to worship. In fact, let me tell you something. Especially when you don't feel like worshiping. Especially when you don't feel like praying. Play a worship song and lie down. See, your spirit is working. Let me tell you what will happen. After a while, you, you cannot rest. The song will not let you rest. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. I'm telling you how I come out of things. The song will not let you rest. Something, your leg will start moving. Then you will sit down on the bed. Then you will lift up one hand. Before you know what's happening, you're on two legs. Before you know what's happening, you're pacing. You're getting there. See, that's how these things work. I can sit down here and give you all the theory, but this is the practical. Glory to God. 
Lift up your hands towards heaven.